Good morning. I praise and thank the Lord for granting me another opportunity to worship and fellowship with you on this Sunday morning. And uh, it is always, always a good experience to come here to Grace Gospel Church because over the years, as I visit you every once in a while, I have noticed that you as individuals, at least those of you that I know personally, and as a church, you have been growing. You have a new facility and you have just expanded your opportunities to do more of God's work. That is growth. Some of the individuals that used to sing in the children's choir are now, now our parents with children who are in the children's choir. That is growth. Uh, some people who um, some people who six of them can use to fit in one pew right now only four of them can fit in one pew that is growth as well now some of you are thinking pastor not everything is growing some of us are actually no longer growing here and uh, my encouragement to you is do not look at it from a negative perspective. You are not losing hair, you are gaining face. So you just buy more facial wash than shampoo. And we can see growth in many aspects of life as a church as a whole and as individuals. However, let me just share with you this morning that Growth doesn't always have to be expanding or extending or adding something. Sometimes, in order for us to grow, we need to lessen certain things. So, I would like to share with you this morning how to grow by reducing. Indeed, many times we cannot grow if we do not reduce. What do I mean? For example, in our society, in our country, in order for our economy to grow, we need to reduce graft and corruption, right? Our individual health, our physical health. In order for us to grow healthy, we need to reduce junk food. So in the same way, in Christian life, in church life, in our walk with the Lord, one of the ways for us to grow is to reduce. And I would like to share with us three important things that we can learn from our passage in order for us to grow. Now, we have already read our main passage. So, my assigned passage is actually Acts chapter 2, but I chose to share with you Acts chapter 1 because I would like to give us an overview of the context of Acts chapter 2. You see, the book of Acts is a story, it's a narrative. And like many stories, many times we miss the point of the story if we do not understand why the story is being told. So chapter 1 actually tells us that everything written in the book of Acts is a manifestation and demonstration and explanation of how the early church grew and expanded as they responded to the Holy Spirit. Indeed, the book of Acts can be aptly titled or retitled the Acts of the Holy Spirit instead of the Acts of the Apostles because we can see that whatever they did, whatever good things that were brought about was, though it was done through human beings, it was actually the activity of the Holy Spirit. And I really praise God that you have chosen at this season in church life, in your individual spiritual lives, talk about the activity of the Holy Spirit. And Acts chapter 1 verse 8 is actually the outline of the book. It says there, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And that was fulfilled in the book of Acts. And chapter 2 describes how the church started and what they did in the early days. But I would like to give us 
some more substantial basis for understanding the Holy Spirit. See, Acts chapter 1 and chapter 2 happened approximately in the year 30 AD. Around 30 years later, the Apostle Paul wrote to Christians in the city of Ephesus, and this is what he said about the Holy Spirit. He says, you were also included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in Him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of His glory. So even though you would read in a story, in a narrative, like in Acts chapter 1 and 2, the coming of the Holy Spirit, the Bible explains to us that in our time, after that special transitional season in the life of the early church, we, well, believers in, the, in, in Ephesus, until our time, we receive the Holy Spirit the moment we come to faith in Jesus. So do not endeavor to look for an extraordinary, supernatural, sensational experience like in Acts chapter 1. That was the first coming of the Holy Spirit. But now, since then and until now, every person who trusts in Jesus has already received the Holy Spirit. So do not think that you as an individual Christian or as a church that you are not able to do the things that the early church does because you still do not have the Holy Spirit. You do. The Holy Spirit indwells you. If you truly believe the gospel message, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. You are sealed with the Holy Spirit. You are children of God and you have His Spirit in you. Because sometimes some people would would just tell others the reason why you're not growing, the reason why your faith is weak is because you don't have the Holy Spirit. That is not true. The Bible clearly says we receive the Spirit when we believe. However, it does not mean that spiritual growth and growth in general would be automatic. In the same letter to the Christians in Ephesus, Paul writes, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So it is possible that while we have the Holy Spirit inside of us, that we grieve Him. We do not walk in step with Him. We resist Him. We do not do the things that we know that He is moving us to do. And we are reminded not to grieve the Holy Spirit. Now some of you are married know the saying, happy wife, happy life, right? And that is somewhat true. Do not displease your spouse. It will, life will not be good. Well, more than that, do not displease the Holy Spirit of God. Because you're not gonna grow and experience the best of Christian life if you breathe Him. Furthermore, Paul encouraged the Ephesian Christians to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Do not get drunk with wine, which, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. To be filled here is the same, practically the same, uh, when you say somebody was filled with joy or somebody was filled with anger. To be filled here is the idea of being controlled. So be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Allow Him to have the driver's seat in your life. And the early church did this, these things. That's the reason why they could experience growth. Now I'd like to share with you three, three things that we need to reduce in order for us to grow as a church and as individual Christians. Uh, these things are not exhaustive, meaning to say you would be able to find more things that you can do, more things that you can reduce in order for you to grow. But in the interest of time, and the purpose for the purpose of our study this morning, I'd like to share with you just three things. First thing that we need to reduce in order for us to grow is we need to reduce size. We need to reduce size in order for us to grow. What do I mean? We need to focus on relationships. We need to think about people before we think about events. And we need to be able to influence people through love, 
Not policies, not rules and regulations, but love. To reduce size means that we need to consider the truth that we cannot have healthy interactions if we're always in the crowd. We cannot spur each other to grow if we're always wanting to be one among the multitudes. See, if we want to grow, whether as a church or as an individual followers of Jesus, we need to grow and we need to reduce the size of our interactions. According to a sociological study, a typical normal individual typically or usually interacts with only 150 people on average. Now, during the age of uh, social media, people challenge that study. But that study still proved to be true. Even if you have a Facebook account and it says there that you have over 2,000 friends, you will discover that more or less you actually only interact with up to 150 people at any given time. Some a little bit less, others a little bit more. But the fact of the matter is, whether you're a believer or not, your social capacity it's a hunt, more or less 150 people. Among the 150 people that you regularly interact with are around 5 to 10 people that are closest to you. They, they know you. They know your secrets. Uh, they are predictable to you and you are predictable to them. And these are your best friends, your spouse, your family members, your small group in church. Now, outside of the 5 to 10 people that are closest to you are another 10 to 15 people that are on the second day. They are your sympathetic community. What do I mean? They are the type of people that when there is a rumor spread about you, they would automatically reject it and they would always assume the best. You would know if somebody is close to you, if there's a rumor that says so-and-so or you did something bad and without any investigation or any evidence those people would automatically assume oh that's not true you are mistaken why because they're close to you of course if you're really a bad person and they know that you would do such a thing they would also be the first people to confirm that because they are close to you they know that you would do such a thing now, extending that further is around 50 people that are called your gravitational community. They are gravitational. They look at your Facebook uh, timeline. They, you, you influence them, they influence you. And then extending it further is around 100 more people that you interact with. Now, depending on your stage in life, the, the people that compose the 150 change. So when you were in high school or college, a bulk of your classmates are in that 150. And then when you graduate from school and go to work, a significant number of uh, classmates that used to be in your 150 are no longer there. Now some of your workmates are in the 150. Now this is a sociological study. However, in the typical church, in the typical church, Many churches cannot grow beyond 150 to 200 membership. And sometimes it is unfair because people assume that the pastor is not so good or the church is not so spiritual. But there might be another factor. The factor is a, an intimate community has difficulty growing beyond a certain number. Because the strength of intimacy is also weakness. Meaning the more people there are, the more diluted relationship is. Every time that there are new people coming in, there are less chances that you have to talk to and interact with the people you're close with. So there's a natural tendency to repel outsiders because you want to spend more time together. I mean, you've experienced this in just eating in your school canteen. You want to spend time with your close friends that uh, a stranger or a not-so-close schoolmate sitting with you is considered a nuisance because he or she will be eating up time and attention from your friends. 
So if that is the situation we find ourselves in, how do we grow as a church and as individual Christians? You reduce the size of your interactions. Focus on relationships. What context can you find yourself in where there could be relationships? See, you can impact people from afar, assuming that you do a good job worship leading or preaching or teaching or leading. But you, you can impress people from afar, I mean. But you impact people up close. Think people before events. Maintain influence through love. My wife and I host several small group discipleships or small uh, discipleship small groups in our home. We have a couples group on Tuesday nights. We, I have a single men's group on Wednesday nights. And my wife goes to a nearby coffee shop to uh, meet with uh, single ladies. And uh, we have been doing this for quite some time now. Uh, this is our fourth year since we started those new groups around 2012 and 2013. And by the grace of God, because of reducing the size of our interactions, we have been able to build strong friendships and spiritual relationships. And by God's grace, we are currently meeting regularly with 20 leaders. When I say leaders, I don't mean that they have any position in church. They don't. But they need their own small groups in their own homes or in places nearby their workplace or their residence. And by extension, while we're meeting with only 20 leaders at a given week, if you will consider the small groups that they meet, in their own homes and the small groups that their small groups need we're actually connected directly to around 600 people actually a total of more or less 100 leaders and 600 people not because of anything special or spectacular or supernatural well the supernatural aspect is the work of the holy spirit in the life of people but when i say nothing supernatural nothing supernatural on our effort it's not extraordinary skill, but we grew because we reduce the size. So as a church, in order for us to grow, we need to reduce the size of our interactions. We need to make sure that in any given week, we have vital relationships where we can share our challenges and struggles as Christians and encourage each other towards growth. The best preacher in the world cannot do that for you from here. The best preacher in the world cannot know your actual situation and pray for you as an individual and encourage you and follow you up to encourage growth. So if we want to grow, we need to reduce the size of our interactions. Don't always go to large group gatherings. Don't always be just part of the crowd or the multitudes. Be part of a vital relationship. Make sure that in your 150, there are people that are godly and spiritual that can spur you towards growth. It is not your pastor, unless you're in the small group of the pastor, but it's not your pastor that will be able to personally come alongside you to help you walk with Jesus. It's other fellow members of the church that you interact with. Second thing that we need to reduce in, in order for us to grow is to reduce our activities. To reduce our activities. We need to focus on the essentials. The early church was described as a community that devoted themselves to the teaching of God's word, that devoted themselves to prayer, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread. Their priorities were whatever encouraged their vertical relationship with God and their horizontal relationship with each other. Willow Creek Community Church over the years has been one of the biggest and most influential churches in the United States. 
Uh, they are led by their founder, Pastor Bill Hybels. And they're influential and, and they help other churches with their global leadership summit, an annual conference where they gather leaders to be able to teach in various fields of expertise to bless the body of Christ. But several years ago, Willow Creek, because they were concerned about the true spirituality of their 25,000 worshippers, they hired a third party in order to check up on the spiritual health of their members. And they discovered that as big as they are, they, their membership are not exactly getting holier or godlier or more mature in Christ. Now, it was really, really honest and brave of them to admit this, that for a large church, doesn't necessarily mean that every member is actually walking intimately with Jesus. And this is what they admitted. They said they used to think that in order to encourage people to grow, that they need to simply get people to be involved. So they thought involvement equals spirituality. Now, don't get me wrong, whether the report or me, myself, we're not saying that involvement has no value. Involvement has a lot of benefits. But involvement by itself does not automatically translate to spirituality. In fact, some churches would discover that it is the number of activities that hinder people from growing. So the early church focused on essentials. I encourage everyone to think process before programs. What does that mean? All of us are in a journey. Our journey is to be more like Jesus every single day. If you want to gauge your progress in the Christian life, are you more like Jesus this month than last month? Are you more like Jesus this year than last year? So it is in a process. But many times we primarily think of programs. What, are, what program are we going to come up with? that people would like to attend. And while these are good, sometimes we clog our schedule with too many activities. Now, uh, some churches, they are called full service church. They have every activity and every program for every age group and for every interest group. To keep people happy, they have sports for the sports-minded, they have parenting for the parents, and they have everything from kids to senior citizens. Those are not bad or wrong in themselves, but many times, whether as a church or as an individual Christian, activity by itself, instead of encouraging growth, it actually hinders our growth. Now think about your typical calendar month. Think about it. If you're a student, you have the same study load as your non-church-going classmates. If you are an employee or an employer, you have the same workload as your non-church-going uh, colleagues or friends or associates. And what do they do with their time outside of school and work and what do you do with your time? Now, of course, Chances are you find yourself making better use of your time. And many of those who don't come to church probably end up doing something foolish with their time outside school or work. However, there are more essential things that we can do and pay attention in other than church activities. For example, some children they take it against the church for taking their parents away from them. Now, it should never be a choice between parenting and serving in church. But because we don't manage our activities and we think church is for God, so I'm willing to sacrifice my family at the altar of ministry. But in all reality, being a good Christian parent is as spiritual as participating in any church activity. Now, if you are one of those who are really involved in uh, ministering to people, you know 
that you are probably on the verge of burnout because you are being expected or encouraged to join almost every activity that the church wants. Why? Because other people would not like to volunteer. And these involvements, instead of encouraging growth, actually drains you. You need to manage not only your time, but your energy. Think about it this way. If you live up to 80 years, you would have 29,200 days on earth. 29,200 days on earth. But since we spend one-third of our lives asleep, in those 29,200 days, we're actually asleep 9,700 days. That leaves us with around 19,500 days awake. And when we're awake, what do we do? Now, I assume that you don't spend an equal amount of time eating and sleeping, right? Right? Maybe just half of the time. Then, uh, since we live in the Philippines, we spend considerable time just in traffic. Let me give you this example. In my life, for every 12 days, for every 12 days, I would have spent one whole day just in traffic. For every 12 days, I would have been in traffic one whole day. And, and not only is it important for us to manage our time or our schedule because we cannot earn time. We can earn money, but we can't earn time. But sometimes we allocate time, but we no longer have energy. For example, you're here serving, but you are not so enthusiastic. And sometimes you feel guilty because you might think you're not so spiritual and you don't love God that much, that's why you're low in energy. But the truth is, you're not unspiritual, you're just physically and mentally and emotionally tired because you don't have that much energy to give anymore. Sometimes, uh, husbands, we set aside schedule for family time, but we don't manage our energy. So we're with our family, we're saying, oh, I took them out to the mall, but what do the husbands do? They excuse themselves, go to the nearby spider mall and get a foot massage and sleep while the kids and, the, and uh, their mom are actually the ones having family time. You allocated time, but you did not manage your energy. And since we have not much time and even less energy, we need to focus on the essentials. The study of God's Word, praying together. I've been to prayer meetings where we actually don't pray a lot. Now, an hour of prayer meeting and we prayed five minutes and we did so many things but we prayed for five minutes. I've been to a prayer meeting like that. And that's not maximizing your time or your energy. That's not focusing on essentials. So look at your typical calendar. And, and mind you, I am not discouraging church involvement. I am a pastor myself. And in uh, CCF, we're largely run by volunteers. So I'll be the last person to discourage people from volunteering. But here's the thing. Look at your typical calendar. And don't just look at church activities. Look at every single thing that a follower of Jesus Christ needs to really be involved in. What are the essential activities? And include family. Because your first calling is your family. You see, if you're a husband, the Lord might ask you to be accountable for many things in church, but I'm 100% sure He will ask you, how much did you love your wife? And He's not talking about a particular multivitamin commercial. He's asking you, if you have really fulfilled your duty as a Christian husband. How much did you respect and submit to your husband? Children, how much did you respect and honor your parents? How much are we responsible for our studies and our work? Manage our energy. Reduce activities. Focus on essentials. Last but not the least, the early church grew because 
they reduce self. They were less about self and more about God. They were God-centered. Everything that they did was for God, about God, for the glory of God, the purpose of God. They thought about dependence on God, not just experience or ability, or in some cases, in experience or in ability. Many times, whether as a church or as an individual Christian, we are afraid to walk with Jesus because of experience or inexperience, or because of ability or inability. We are afraid to try again to talk to somebody about Jesus because of inexperience, we have not done it before, or because of experience, we have not been happy with our previous attempts. And we don't think about depending on God and you, we think about our experience. Sometimes we just have a very good gauge of our ability or inability and then we limit the work of the Holy Spirit. Do you know that the early church grew far more than any modern church and yet they had far less than any typical modern church? They don't have a new facility because they don't have any facilities. They didn't have much freedom. They didn't have much money. They didn't have many things that we have now. The believers at that time, the Old Testament were in scrolls. The New Testament was just being written. And the individual Christian in New Testament church did not even own a personal Bible. They would need to gather together. A scroll of the Old Testament needs to be rolled out and it needs to be read. And they needed to listen because they don't have their own copies. Here, nowadays, we have so many Bibles, you have so much to choose from, right? It's so specific. There's the um, single women's Bible. And that actually makes me curious, but I cannot read it because I'm not a single woman, right? I, I, I don't know, okay? There's a sports edition Bible where the cover is made up of either basketball rubber or football leather. See, I was holding one in a Christian bookstore and I was almost tempted to see if it will bounce. <laughs> but since it was expensive, I didn't want to take the risk of ruining it. But mind you, we have so many things, but we are also so full of self. If the reason why the early church was had less of self because they were full of the Holy Spirit. They didn't have much, but they maximized their usability for God's purpose and glory. They were just willing to be used by God. They were not focused on excuses. They were just wanting to experience the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Um, as we tie up our message, let me share with you a personal testimony. Not about church work, not about uh, ministry as a full-time pastor, but about real life. You see, uh, last year, my wife and I needed to look for a new place to rent because our rental, our rent contract is, was about to expire and the, we could not renew because the house was already sold. And they, the, the new owner was just waiting for our contract to expire. And then we needed a place where my wife and I can, can move into. And with the specifics that, uh, that we were deciding to, to, to stay at, uh, particularly we wanted to stay in Quezon City area, and uh, we wanted a place that is both convenient and safe. Something that all of us would want, right? However, we had a limited budget. And realistically, if I would look at our budget and our needs, they don't seem to match. So this is what I told my wife. And husbands, as leaders, we need to exude confidence. So I told my wife, don't worry. Either God will provide more resources or He will stretch the capability of our resources with confidence. 
And then I run to God in prayer because I told God, Lord, what am I going to do? My budget will not actually suffice. But I know that you will provide. So husbands, that's what you do. When you talk to your wife, exude Christian confidence. And then you run to God in prayer. Okay? So that's leadership. You're not pretending to be any stronger than you really are. You're just depending on God. But you don't tell your wife, Yeah, I know. I don't know what to do. We might not have any place to live in come November. Don't do that, okay? And then she'll begin to think, This is the guy that I'm supposed to submit to. Okay, don't do that. So we prayed. We prayed. We prayed. We prayed. We found a place. And it was within our budget. But there was a problem. It needed renovation. Repainting, repiping, and it would cost a lot. And I told my wife, place is good, but we don't have the budget for the renovation. And we don't want to go in debt. We don't want to spend money that we don't have. So during our mid-year prayer and fasting in CCF, after one of the prayer times, I was on my way to the parking and uh, I happened to find myself in the same elevator. Just imagine uh, 5,000 people praying and just two of us in the elevator going down. And he was a friend of mine in church. And I asked him, oh, have you, ever, have you already found a place to move? Because I knew that a few months back he was also looking to move. And he said, yes. And I said, uh, pray for us because it's really tricky and difficult to, to find an appropriate place to move in. And he said, Really? You're looking? I have a friend who needs a tenant. And he lives in this area. And uh, would you like me to give your number to him? And then I said, wow, sure. Okay. Now, I was not so expectant because I knew the area. And the typical rental rate in that area is beyond my budget. Okay? So I'm hopeful, but I'm not deluded. Okay? I spare myself from disappointment by not by, by studying um, you know actual tangible things. But the owner of the townhouse contacted us the following day. And he seemed very eager to have us visit him. So I told my wife, and it was Monday, it was my day off. I told my wife, you know. He's such a nice guy and he doesn't know that we can't afford that area. But since he wants to meet us, let's just go. So when I saw the place, now, mind you, it's not an extravagant place. It's not a huge place and it's not anything over the top. But because the area is nice and the, I knew the rental there was, was of a different scale. So we just, we were trying to be courteous by just letting him give us a tour. In my mind, I'm just going to find a way to tell him thank you very much for your time and uh, God bless uh, in uh, looking for a, a tenant. So after the tour, I finally asked him without much enthusiasm, so how much are you renting this out for? And he said, my original price is this much, which is typical, not overpriced, standard, standard uh, rental rate. But he said, but Nobody seems to be interested. And my papers for abroad has already come and I am required, my family and I are required to leave in three weeks or else we will forfeit that opportunity. So, I have already, since the other week, I've already lowered my asking price to this much. And his new rate Without me handling at all, his new rate was exactly my budget. Exactly my budget. And he said, you know, the week before I met you, somebody came and I offered him the amount. And he said, what happened? And he said, he even handled. So I did not get him as a tenant. But he said, but you know what? I need somebody, I need a tenant for long term. Are at least four years. And my wife and I are looking for a long-term rent. And he said, you know what? It's funny thing. After I had everything here renovated, see this townhouse is not brand new, but it seems new because I had it completely renovated. And then the day after I paid for the renovation, the papers for my family and I to go abroad came. 
So long story short, we got the place. Now, why is that my story? See, here's the thing. There's just my wife and myself. We don't have kids yet, okay? However, we needed such a place because we wanted to bless our extended family. See, my mom, my brother is in Canada. My mom is still very independent, very healthy, has her own small shop, and she rents her own apartment, and um, she has somebody that stays with her, a relative, but I wanted her to retire and to stay with us so that I could take care of her. But that means another bedroom. See, my wife and I only need one bedroom. Maximum of two if we're going to have kids sometime in the future. But because we want to honor my mom, we need another bedroom. Now, my, my wife, my wife's dad passed away seven years ago. And uh, she has a younger sister who's still in college. And uh, her sister studies in the Quezon City area. And while we are not being obligated to take her in, it would be difficult for her to commute to and fro passing to Quezon City. So we need another bedroom. So even though we don't have kids, just us, we can actually live with a smaller budget or we can maximize our budget. But we could just say, you know, my, my, I just give to my mom, my brother gives to my mom, she's happy with her apartment, let her stay there. She doesn't want to retire anyway, so let her keep her store. And then uh, my wife's sister is not really our responsibility, let her be. But we cannot be full of self. And the reason why we experience God working, you know, so I told God, Lord, I don't want people to give me pastor's price and feel that they get held up because they cannot charge a pastor a lot. You see, he lowered his rate before he met me. He didn't give me a pastor's discount. That was his rate. In fact, his reaction was, I was an answered prayer to his prayers. That he needed somebody who would pay this rent for long term. And we wouldn't experience God's grace in that endeavor if we were full of self. If we were to say, you know what, it's just the two of us, never mind other people. Let's, do, let's just keep our meager resources to ourselves. In fact, we wanted a bigger place specifically to host small groups in our place. We have a 10-seater dining table. And just to clarify, I just use one spot, okay? I don't move from one spot to the other spot in the same meal. We don't need a 10-seater, but we want to host people in our homes so that we can help each other grow in Jesus. And God has provided. And I had nothing to do with it except get rid of self. So if we want to grow, we need to reduce size. See, don't just find yourself in the crowd. Be in vital relationships. We need to reduce activities. Don't just fill your calendars with church activities and other activities. Focus on essentials. Manage not only your time, but also your energy. And reduce self. Depend on God. Be filled with God instead of self. Self-effort, self-interest. And by the grace of God, you will grow. Now, there's a popular and familiar vitamin uh, commercial. And it uh, actually features a retired uh, Philippine professional basketball player and his uh, teenage son. I'm sure you're familiar with that commercial. And uh, this vitamin is uh, being advertised as something that will promote growth, height in particular. Now my my wife has a cousin who's based in the States. And when, last year when we visited the, her relatives in the States, we, I got to meet the cousin. And uh, he's a varsity high school basketball player. And I saw him um, really having a lot of that uh, vitamin. Right? And he, at five foot nine, is already around three inches taller than his dad. And I told my wife, it doesn't matter how much of that vitamin E he takes, chances are he's not going to grow any taller. Why? I'm not here for a smear campaign against any product. 
But if you think about it, while any vitamin or supplement can possibly help you improve in some ways or maximize your potential, you will not be able to surpass your genetic potential in terms of height. Okay? Now, don't use this as a weapon against your parents. Now, if your parents tell you, if you only drink milk, sleep enough, eat your vegetables, you'll be taller. And you're going to say, no, I'm not going to grow any taller because you're not any taller, mom and dad. Okay? I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that the guy in the commercial is six and a half feet tall because his dad is six foot four. Whether he's taking those vitamins or not, I am almost sure he would grow at least up to six feet. But if your dad is five foot six and your mom is five foot three, five foot nine is already an accomplishment. Be happy with it. Here's the thing. Our spiritual potential to grow as a church and as individual followers of Jesus is so vast. Because our spiritual Parenthood is not limited in terms of growth potential. See, you might be able to tell your dad, Dad, I can't grow to be six feet, you're just five foot six. Five nines in accomplishment. But we don't need to fear in terms of our Heavenly Father. You can't say, Heavenly Father, I cannot grow. Because you're limited. He is not. And is it possible that our potential for growth as a church and as individual followers of Jesus can be improved if we reduce size, if we reduce activities, and if we reduce self? May the Lord bless each one of us as we endeavor to obey His word. Can we close in prayer? Father, I thank you for your people. I know that they aspire and yearn to grow in all aspects of their lives. And I pray that you would honor their desire and grant them the wisdom and the strength to be able to apply the word that we have heard this morning. Bless each one, O oh Lord, and continue to bless us even as the rest of your family in Grace Gospel worship you in the second and third services. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.